Hi, I'm Nevaeh, I'm from Shano. Hi, I'm Emily and I'm from Shano. We're gonna play a game as a small group, it's telepathy. The point of the game is to read your partner's mind. So this is how you play telepathy. So you're gonna find a partner, you guys are gonna get a question read to you, then you guys have to try to answer the question behind your back, then they will reveal it, like you'll turn around and reveal the answer. So if you got different answers, then you would go find a new partner, but if you got the same answer, you would stay with that partner until you got a different answer. Good luck. Good luck, guys. You got it. Hi guys, it's Katie. I'm from Shano. Um, so, a few quick announcements. We have the three R's first of all, which are respect yourself, respect others, and respect the property. You follow those three and you're going to have a great time. Also, this last Wednesday of October, we have Freaky Fun Night. Um, it's a great opportunity to bring your friends. And another way to stay connected is you can follow us on Instagram at our Refuge Youth, which is YTH. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Refuge. My name is Pastor Chris, and I am so glad that you are joining us tonight. And welcome to the inaugural Refuge Goes Home. This is our maiden voyage, so we're all in this together. Real quick, do me a favor. If you have a smartphone or a smart device, why don't you go ahead and take that out and open up the Uversion app. That's Y-O-U. It's a great resource. It's free. And it's just another great way for you to stay engaged with the message. If you go in the lower right-hand corner, you're going to find more. And then under the Events tab, you will find Refuge Youth. Again, just another great way for you to stay connected to the message. Now, some of you may notice just kind of addressing, you know, the the pig and room, if you may, or whatever the saying is. Some of you may notice we're not at Hope Church. We're in someone's living room, basement, or house right now. Some of you have been asking, why are we doing Refuge Goes Home? And really, it's for two reasons. Reason number one, we want to remove any barriers that we can from anyone who is looking or considering into joining God's family. And for some people, walking into a church building just makes them nervous. Something about the space, something that brings up their past that makes them feel, I just, I can't move forward. So, on our part, we're doing what we can to remove any barriers so that people can come and experience God's family. The second reason, in conversations with some of you, some of you have shared, you would be more inclined to invite your friends if you met in a home setting. And one of our values at Refuge is to be others-focused. And what that looks like is we pay attention to others, and one way of doing that, we invite people to Refuge. So, we're trying it. We're all stakeholders in this ministry experience and ministry partners in this process. And that's why we're doing Refuge Goes Home. So we're on our second week of Welcome to the Family, and we're going to talk about what it looks like to share our faith, especially in regards to personality types. Now, for some of you, one of the things that I enjoy and maybe that you enjoy is taking personality exams. Now, I, I recently I took a personality exam in regards to Star Wars. And if you don't know this about me, I am a Star Wars nerd. 
I, I, I love the movies. I love the story. I love the saga. It is just one of the greatest cinematic experiences. And when I took this Star Wars uh, personality exam, I got, and no surprise to me, I got the personality of Anakin Skywalker. Now, if you don't know Anakin's story, I don't want to give any spoilers away. It is a story where you see goodness, where you see darkness, and where you see redemption. And Anakin, his personality wiring, he is someone who is going to follow his gut. He is guided by his emotions. And so what does that tell me about myself and what I need to have? It means I need to have some self-awareness because I'm similar to Anakin in that I follow my gut and I can be guided by my emotions, but I don't need to be. I can let my emotions inform me. I don't have to let them guide me. And that is the differentiation between me and Anakin. Now, why am I talking about this? Why am I comparing myself to this make-believe character? Is it out myself as a Star Wars nerd? No, it's not. But I think for many of us, Personality exams, they're fun, they're intriguing, and there's just something fantastical about it. Because on one hand, when we do a personality exam, there's a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of imaginative work involved, because maybe we're examining our favorite book, our favorite movie, or our favorite comic book, and we're just hoping, man, I I hope my character can resemble that of another character. So on one hand, there's something fantastic about it. And on the other hand, personality exams can bring awareness. Again, Anakin Skywalker, his story turns to the dark side of the force. There's real loss. There's a reality where he was guided by his emotions and he made poor decisions by that. Now, again, I'm not saying that's my story, but a wise person can examine themselves and anticipate how they can come across to other people. So when it comes then to inviting people into God's family, it does involve a level of self-awareness. It involves us understanding who we are, how we operate in stress, our responses, our dispositions. And so what I'm going to do tonight, we are going to talk about three personalities that we have seen within the church when it comes to inviting people into the family of God. And this process is going to involve great humility because it's going to invite us to receive correction as well as make the correction to better love God and to better love your neighbor. So what are those three personalities? Check this out. The first one is the shark. Now, sharks, they are aggressive. This is the person, they have the answer to everything. They think they have the best theology. You have a problem, well, they have a solution. They will figure it out aggressively, assertively. They will be militant. They sometimes seem unsafe and not fun to be around. Here's the thing about sharks. They have tunnel vision. And they can be so focused on the goal of inviting people into God's family that they forget that they're dealing with real people with real pain. It's almost as though that the pain that these people are experiencing doesn't matter, that they don't need to address that. They are quick to offer hope before they build value and express value and build trust with them, okay? What the shark does is they put pressure on people or they put pressure on the program. The second personality is this, the carp. Carps see themselves as the victim. This is the person that it always appears to have like a gray cloud over their head. This is the person who's hopeless, who maybe had experienced a fallout, and now is wondering, what do I have to offer? What can I give? This is the person who doesn't even recognize their uniqueness or their gift mix, and they believe that it just falls short ultimately. Now, often what has happened with the carp, at what point they were sharks. They were aggressive. They were on fire. They may have been an all-star. They may have been a leader in the youth group. They may have been a leader in the church. They may have been a leader in the classroom, but something happened where they fell short. They got burned out. The carp, they like to put pressure on themselves. And finally, the third personality type is the dolphin. Dolphins are purposeful. They are on mission. They love to have fun. They are enthusiastic and they keep good boundaries. And they also have this ability to navigate well their personal responsibilities as well as others' responsibilities. 
They know how to come alongside people. They are empathetic. They are willing to meet people and their feelings and understand where they are coming from. They're willing to put the work to know the other, if you may. They're hopeful about what Jesus can do in someone's life because they have experienced for themselves what it is like to be a part of God's family, and they are overflowing with gratitude because of that. And because of that overflow, that's Colossians 2, 6 through 7, they want others to experience that overflow as well. The dolphin, they keep the pressure on God. Now, I believe many of us, we carry the personality of a dolphin, but when we act like a shark or when we act like a carp, the message becomes difficult to believe for the people that we are trying to include into God's family. Check this out. By giving ourselves to God, we can be ourselves to others. Now, I'm going to unpack this a little further on down the message, but as we address what Scripture has to say, before we get there, I want to ask two questions. Wouldn't it be nice to be ourselves more rather than just fake it? Wouldn't it be nice to be your real, authentic self as God has designed you to be rather than someone who is always faking it to make it? And my second question, how do we see that played out in Scripture? Now, if you have a Bible or you're on the Bible app, go ahead and turn to the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to see in this chapter, in this book, how two characters, Saul and David, how they put pressure, where they place their pressure, and the result of that pressure. Now, if you're someone who's also into history, if you're into war and violence and just kings rising and falling, 1 Samuel is a great book for you to check out. So we're going to find ourselves in 1 Samuel Chapter 17, verse 37. Check this out. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. That's David speaking. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now, to paint the picture a little bit of what's going on here, David is the youngest of his family. And culturally speaking, in this time frame in Israel, when war broke out, it was expected that the older siblings would head to war, leaving the younger siblings behind to maintain the home, to help their father, to help their mother, and responsibilities around the home. Like, think of it this way. Have you ever had an older sibling or maybe an older friend who was able to do something that you were not able to do because of your age? It's frustrating, right? It's deflating. It makes us feel left out. That is probably something similar that David was experiencing. And so with David's brothers gone, David had more responsibility at home. And this is where we find David. One of those responsibilities that his father assigned to him was bring your brother's food on the battle lines. And so David is approaching and the battle lines, these literal battle lines are drawn between the two nations of Israel and the Philistines. And the Philistines, they have a secret weapon for Israel. And his name is Goliath. Someone who had been fighting since he was a little boy. And no one from Israel wanted to face Goliath. Because they believed it would be certain death with his skills. And David, he sees Goliath and he says, I'll do it. I'll fight this Philistine. And David, by the way, if you're in middle school, David, by the way, he was probably around 6th, 7th grade age time frame at this point of the story. And so Saul looks at David's age and looks at him and says, you are not qualified. Again, based on his age. And so there are three things here from the story that we just read, three pieces that we can draw inspiration from in regards to welcoming people and coming alongside people and asking them to maybe consider joining God's family. And the first one is this. Check this out. David kept the pressure on God. David told Saul he has killed lions and bears when defending his father's sheep. See, David was a shepherd, so it was normal for him to be out for long periods of time in the wilderness, away from home, and having to defend himself and defend his sheep. 
David, in other words, he knew what he was doing. But David, more important than that, David shared a key phrase with Saul. God, the Lord who rescued me. See, David knew that God had his back. David also knew, I have the skills to face Goliath, to face Goliath but more importantly, David also recognized that God would join him in battle. God would go with him in battle. You see, you and I, I think from this story, can gather something here that's very important. You and I also have skill sets. We know how to connect with people on varying levels, but regardless, we know how to connect with people. So my question for you, do we acknowledge that despite our varying skill levels in connecting with people, that God is fully present in that? You know, maybe for some of us, we feel like we're about to go into battle when it comes to inviting people into God's family. Maybe for some of us, we, we feel like we are in a battle when we're welcoming people to God's family. Because maybe there's a question that they ask that you don't know how to answer. Maybe there's a situation that you're observing and reading around, and, and you don't know what the best response is. Maybe that's your battle. So let me ask this. If you believe God is as big as you say he is, is God big enough then to defend himself? In other words, can you keep the pressure on God? Can you sit in that tension and leave the pressure alone on God? Because by the way, this invites us then to respond and act out in faith, which at the end of the day is just stepping into obedience to Jesus. Number two, Saul put pressure on the tools. Saul gave David permission to fight Goliath. Now, I want to assume the best about Saul here, and I, I really do mean this. I think Saul meant well, but Saul also missed what David said earlier, the Lord who rescued me. See, Saul outfits David with his armor. Saul gives David his weaponry, believing that Saul possessed the right tools ultimately to face and defeat Goliath. And David shared with Saul, again earlier, man, Saul, I used a club to bring down a lion, to bring down bears who snatched my father's sheep. Right? right? David is sharing these stories because David recognized two things. Number one, God would rescue him. Number two, therefore I could put my trust in him. David recognized that God would rescue him, and because of that, David can put his trust in God. And I think for some of us, we put pressure on church, we put pressure on refuge, we put pressure on our youth pastor, we put pressure on youth workers, because we believe that is what's going to bring change to people. See, God is the only person who could bring change into someone's life. Jesus, not the program, is the initiator of, Jesus, uh, of change. Jesus, not you or me, is the initiator of change. Number three, David gave himself to God. This is key refuge. This is key for us to understand and grasp. David ultimately chose not to use the armor, not to use the weapons that Saul gave him. Yes, there was a practical component here. It's, it's here in Scripture for us to read. David couldn't move. But even bigger than that, David made the decision to give all of himself to God as an act of faith in response to God. Now, for many of us, that response is probably not going to involve great bodily harm. But that response might involve a risk of a loss of reputation. Throughout Scripture, Jesus included, when people chose to give themselves to God fully, they also chose to expose themselves to some form of risk. But by choosing to give ourselves to God, we align ourselves with God's mission and have a front row seat in witnessing and experiencing God's goodness in our lives and the lives of others. Matthew 11, Jesus talks about this. When we align ourselves with God's heart, the things that excite God excite us. The things that sat on God sat on us. Why? Because we are working and walking with Jesus. And in that working and walking, we are in full alignment, learning the unforced rhythms of grace that Jesus wants to give to us. Check this out. By giving ourselves to God, 
we can be ourselves to others. You see, it is our desire for you when you come to Refuge not to initiate or imitate someone's faith like my own or like a youth worker's faith. We are hoping that when you come to refuge, you come into proximity with Jesus, and in doing so, you recognize your uniqueness, that God knitted you intimately in your mom's womb, that God says you are his boy, that God says you are his girl, that you are adopted, and out of this place of security, you just want to invite people into God's family. You see, it's a step more into the uniqueness of being who God has designed you to be, I believe, is what's going to get us excited and welcoming people into God's family. Because when we operate out of a place of security, when we operate out of a place of adoption, we are then more ourselves, and therefore more excited to welcome people into God's family. And that can start right now, this evening, by keeping the pressure on God because it is you surrendering to God. So which personality are you? Are you a shark? Do you put pressure on people or on the program? Or are you a carp? Are you someone who's burned out on religion? Are you someone who feels they have little or nothing left to offer? Or are you a dolphin? Do you recognize your uniqueness? Do you keep the pressure on God? See, if you or I put pressure on anything or anyone other than God, I would argue our hearts are more attuned away from God. And if our hearts are attuned away from God's heart, it becomes very hard to invite others into God's family because it's just not going to excite us. Because we're not going to recognize what gets our Father's heart excited or what saddens our Father's heart. Because we're not walking or working with Jesus. Friends, you and I need to recognize and reflect on who or what we put the pressure on. We need to recognize, we need to practice some self-awareness when it comes to inviting people into God's family, what personality type we possess when we are welcoming people into God's family. And we also need to recognize that maybe for some of us, we don't invite people into God's family because we're just simply lazy. If that's you, I would encourage you to take a moment to repent, to come to Jesus and acknowledge where you are at. He will not be shocked, but he will be gentle with you. You will not catch God off guard. See, a wise person examines themselves. A wiser person humbles themselves. And so at Refuge, we want to be others-focused. And one way we act in being others-focused is that we invite people to Refuge. And when we do that, we are doing that with the anticipation and expectation that we are keeping the pressure on God. Because our job is obedience, and God's job is outcome. And so one way that we're going to try to do this— On the last Wednesday of October, we are having Freaky Fun Night, and iServe is doing a really good job in creating and facilitating a space that is conducive for you to invite people in. Yes, we are going to have our flag football tournament. We are going to have a pumpkin slingshot. We're going to do our pumpkin carving. We're going to have the things that you expect and some new things for Freaky Fun Night, but we're doing these things not just so it's a place to attend, but so it can be a place to belong for someone. We're doing this so that we can include people into God's family. We're doing this so that we can elevate one another to welcome friends into God's family and so that people can come into Jesus' proximity and maybe be adopted into God's family. See, I, I want to share a quick, brief story with you. Last school year, one of our own invited a friend to Freaky Fun Night. Their friend's youth worker observed over the school year clear spiritual progression as they made personal yes decisions in their discipleship process. When we come into Jesus' proximity, we believe it changes the atmosphere. We believe it changes that person's environment. And when we keep the pressure on God, we are trusting God with the outcome. Because by trusting God with the outcome, we are ultimately giving ourselves to God, and therefore, we can be our true, authentic selves. Dear God, I pray for the people that are here tonight and that the message that they received uh, goes to their heart and is saved there. And I also pray that they have good conversations with the people that they're surrounded with, whether that's just specifically about God or whatever the conversation 
goes for, about the message. Amen.